On behalf of the Medical Graduates Association, I'm delighted to welcome you to the third and final event in our 2021 Distinguished Graduate Awards series and thank you very much for taking the time to join us. The series has been a tremendous success to date. In January we had the pleasure of presenting Dr Paul O'Byrne, who is an Irish-Canadian respirologist and Dean, Vice President-elect of the Faculty of Health Sciences and Dean of Michael de Groot School of Medicine, McMaster University in Ontario, Canada, from the class of 1975, with a Distinguished Graduate Award. And in February, we had the pleasure of awarding Dr. Marianne Sina, coordinator of the Farage Centre Hospice and Palliative Care Program in Tanzania, who was also from the class of 1975. And on both of those occasions, more than 150 of you joined us to acknowledge Dr. O'Burns and Dr. Sina's commitment to a life in medicine and their many achievements to date. And many more have since viewed the videos from these two award events on our YouTube channel. So we are gathered again this evening to acknowledge another of our esteemed graduates, key contributions to medical education and practice. This evening we are delighted that our award recipient will be Dr. John Dunhu, retired consultant nephrologist from the class of 1967. After graduation, Dr. Dunhu undertook his clinical training at St. Vincent's Hospital, where he completed his SHO and registrar posts, followed by a one-year research fellowship in metabolic medicine. Dr. Dunhu then spent the next eight years in New England. During that time, he completed a residency program in internal medicine in Boston City Hospital, which culminated in his appointment as chief medical resident. He was then appointed to a two-year nephrology research fellowship at Tufts University, and then in 1974 he was appointed assistant professor of medicine and clinical director of the renal division of Boston City Hospital and Boston University School of Medicine. In 1978, Dr. Dunhu came home to take up his appointment as consultant nephrologist at Beaumont and the Mater Misericordia Hospitals. His career in Dublin spanned the next 30 years when he enjoyed intertwined roles as clinician, teacher, researcher and administrator. Dr. Donoghue retired from clinical medicine in 2007 and that same year he was elected to the presidency of the Royal College of Physicians and served as college president until 2011. Dr. Donoghue will be interviewed by Professor Pat Murray this evening. Many of you already know Professor Murray who is Professor of Clinical Pharmacology, UCD, and consultant physician and nephrologist at Mater Misericordia University Hospital, and who also served as Dean and Head of the School of Medicine at UCD from December 2012 to June 2018. During this conversation, Professor Murray will explore Dr. Dunhu's career in more detail as we aim to give you, our graduates, that reunion and memory type feel throughout this event. But before the conversation, we'd like to play a very special greeting from Dr. Leslie Lamb, who also graduated from the class of 1967 and who is now UCD DATO and consultant cardiologist, Far Park Medical Center, Singapore. Good evening, Dublin. Greetings from Singapore. My name is Leslie Lam, and I graduated MBPCH BAO from UCD, class of 1967. I would like to thank the Medical Graduates Association for this opportunity to have a lifelong link with the medical school and the university. I've had the honor of receiving the Distinguished Graduate Award in 2017. We have been, had a rather successful bunch in the year of uh, 1967 graduate. The late Helen Carty or Helen Maloney was a world-renowned figure in pediatric radiology. She also received the Distinguished uh, Graduate Award in the past. Uh, Dr. Patrick J. Bolin, full-time member in the orthopedic service in the Department of Surgery at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, in New York. Professor Trevor McGill, Professor ENT at, medical, at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Neil Keeney, renowned respiratory physician. Dr. John Lennon, a well-known gastroenterologist in Dublin, and Dr. Desmond Duff, renowned pedi pediatric cardiologist uh, from Kremlin Hospital. Tonight we're here to honor John Donahue, who has been nominated for his lifelong achievement in medical clinical practice. John was the president of the Royal College of Physicians 
2007 to 2011. And at the annual meeting of the Royal College of Physicians, he spoke out against the Bahrain government for their action against health professionals in Bahrain. This was noted internationally. John was trained in nephrology in the US and came back to practice in Dublin. It is a dream of every Irish doctor to come home and be recognized at home. I'd like to congratulate John for this great achievement. Please enjoy the presentation of the award. I'm sorry I cannot be there personally, even though I had nominated John for this pre prestigious award. I would like to say, take this opportunity to say hello to all our other classmates. And if any one of you should come to Singapore or go through Singapore, please contact me and I will promise you a very good time. Thank you one and all. Goodbye from Singapore. Hello, John, and uh, congratulations on receiving this uh, Medical Graduate Association Award. I'm delighted to spend some time with you and ask you a few questions. Uh, which we'll share with uh, members of the Medical Graduate Association around the world. John, it's, uh, it's been a while since you graduated from UCD, 1967. Can you tell us a little bit about your time in Earlsford Terrace and some of your fondest memories of that period? Yes, yes indeed. Thank you, Pat. Uh, that's right. It was a, a, a period remembered fondly because it was a very easy time compared to uh, the way we are now, or even even uh, in more recent times, it was uh, a quieter time, a, a more fun time, perhaps, and uh, certainly the location of Earthward Terrace lent itself to uh, a, a lovely ambiance. You had uh, Stevens Green on your doorstep, Grafton Street for a cup of coffee, and Rob Roberts, the Green Cinema to duck into if there was a less than scintillating lecture available, which that wasn't often the case. Uh, but then, of course, there were the public houses nearby, Hartigan's Public House and, and, uh, and uh, Kerwin House, etc. So there was a comfort about that whole area, sort of a village almost. And then, of course, the uh, St. Vincent's Hospital was right there as well. So the whole thing was a, 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 a buzzy, a fun, a happy time, as far as I'm concerned. And in between times, we did a considerable amount of work, I think, as well. And uh, m moving on to the, the, the second half of your career as an undergraduate, John, can you tell us a bit about your clinical attachments as a student? The clinical attachments were almost exclusively at St. Vincent's Hospital, as it was then, St. Stephen's Green. Um, it also was a, a small, sort of intimate, place, uh, a community, if you like, uh, again, pleasant uh, and not too busy. It was right next to the college, so you could adjourn to the college for your afternoon lectures or whatever might, might, might happen. So as regards the place itself, it was full of characters, interesting characters. Our consultant overlords were there. They were all different. Uh, some were kind, some were not so kind. Some were angry, <laughs> some were stern. But you know, I was thinking about it, Pat, they, they all had this commitment, this love even of, of teaching, clinical teaching. And that came across, they, they, even though I'm sure they weren't well remunerated or perhaps at all remunerated, but they really had this drive to, to, um, to, in, to bring us into the world of medicine, uh, clinical medicine, which was, was a very nice memory to have, I think, of those undergrad, of the, that period of, of clinical training. And where, where did you do your, your subspecialty rotations, like your obstetrics and your pediatrics? Right, yes, we, we, we did that in, in the National Maternity Hospital in Hollis Street. Uh, we lived in at the time, I remember. Um, it was exciting, it was different. And uh, I remember we were mixed with students from the College of Surgeons at the time. That was our first interaction, really, at, a, uh, at that level. And we really enjoyed that interaction. It was, uh, there was a lot of waiting time, waiting for deliveries to happen, etc. But it was also very pleasant. I mean, there was 
very vigorous tennis, table tennis uh, championships going on. There was outdoor tennis uh, courts. So it, it had a, a, a certain uh, uh, fun about it as well. And uh, the training was good. Um, and it, we, we got some hands on. And, and then when there was a cesarean section, a bell was rung and we all chased upstairs to the observation gallery to, to observe this wondrous event taking place. So that was very, very pleasant. Uh, paediatrics then took place in Crumlin, uh, which had a very high standard of uh, teaching, uh, didactic particularly every single morning at, at 9.30, I remember, uh, every single morning, followed by ward rounds and ward work. So that was a very good experience as well. So, and then finally, of course, we ended up in uh, St. Brendan's doing our, uh, our uh, mental uh, psychiatry rotations there. So there was quite a, a mix of venues to be, to be visited. Very interesting. And uh, what can you tell us about your, your internship and your time in clinical medicine in Ireland? Where did you spend your other yes, periods? Yes, that, that again was in, within St. Vincent's. Uh, Pat interned there with, with uh, Chief of Medicine, with Professor Medicine, D. Kerr Donovan, and with James E. Maher, surgeon. So we did six months, six months traditional internship followed by an SHO year where I rotated around three monthly intervals in internal medicine. And that was very instructive and helped one maybe form ideas about what you might want to do. You'd already made the decision that you weren't going to be a surgeon or, you, or an obstetrician, but you were going to try and be a physician. And so the SHO sampling uh, helped to inform you of, of where you might go, what direction. And then I moved to being a research fellow in the metabolic unit in the old St. Vincent's Hospital uh, with Frank Muldowney. And he was, uh, of course, committed to predominantly metabolic medicine, metabolic bone disease. And I found that very interesting. But he also had a hat as a, as a nephrologist, even though there wasn't much nephrology going on at the time in, in St. Vincent's. It had, it had started and, and was developing in, in Jervis Street Hospital. But, um, we did have a, a kidney machine there, of all things, a brand new, spanking brand new kidney machine, which was unused, covered, uh, covered up. And uh, I took it upon myself to get to know how to use that. And, and so I, I did get to use that during my time there. And that really sparked my interest, I think, in, in, in the nephrology aspect of, of uh, the metabolic unit. That was my first kind of taste, if you like, of that. And I was, got to use the machine, not very often, but with some success. And to see a young woman who'd, who'd gone into kidney failure following a catastrophic experience in pregnancy, to recover from that with the help of this uh, kidney machine was, was to me a very uh, gratifying and uh, encouraging and inspirational thing to see. And so I think that started it, Pat, that my interest in nephrology and particularly perhaps in acute renal failure was already awakened at that at that point by that experience. And then John you moved to Boston in 1970 and uh, can you tell us about how you chose to go to Boston and and how your career progressed over there? A great tradition had evolved of uh, young Irish medical graduates going to the UK for training to to the better hospitals, teaching hospitals, London hospitals. There was a great cachet about that. But perhaps starting a little before my time, America began to be a place to go for postgraduate training. Um, and I, I had had Murish Fitzgerald, uh, a dear friend uh, at the time, went to Boston and uh, encouraged me to do the same. Uh, and I applied uh, really, uh, not knowing a huge amount about the setup, but I, I did get a position then at Boston City Hospital. And all of the uh, comfort and ease and fun of the old St. Vincent's disappeared overnight because it was a mad place to, to, to go to. Uh, I remember uh, one incident during my internship in, in Dublin when uh, I was on call for the first time, we had live-in call at that time, and uh, I did all the 
the prescriptions for sleeping tablets and so on and, and retired to bed at about 11 o'clock expecting, you know, a busy night. And then at about half past three, I got a call from the then night matron, night supervisor who said that uh, she hoped I didn't, she was sorry to ring me at that time and to wake me and that she had dealt with a man who had appeared in casualty with uh, too much drink on board and she had given him a stern uh, talking to and sent him on his way and she hoped that was all right with me and I said that's fine thank you very much and I went back to sleep only to wake up very disappointed at half past eight the next morning not having seen anybody else so it was that kind of a laid back uh, but of course that's all changed here now as you know uh, but I have to tell you that, that about the emergency room set up and A&E and all that but so then when I transferred to Boston City, it was just that with bells on. We used to do, you know, a month on and a month off uh, ward duty as, as junior residents. And you were li we used to literally do every second weekend, do sort of 72 to 80 hours, you know, from Friday morning right through to Monday afternoon uh, on, on frontline call uh, in, uh, on the wards. And... The casualty, the, the, the emergency room set up was, was, was uh, unbelievable, you know, for, for somebody coming from that sheltered almost existence in Ireland. But it was very informative, very challenging, but wonderfully educational and hardened you up quite quickly and got you into that mode of, of, of being an acute physician. It was, it was wonderful in that way. And um, uh, so then, uh, you know, I remember one of the very first, another stimulus towards, towards nephrology was uh, my, again, my very, almost my first week in the emergency room in Boston City. I mean, there were gunshots and things that we had never seen before, but, but there was also a man, a poor man who'd, who'd drunk um, antifreeze. And, and so he had this catastrophic, I'm afraid, fatal metabolic acidosis. And, uh, do you know, that stimulated my sense of, of the acute medicine and typified by, by nephrology, you know, that you had that sort of um, life or death situation very often. And you could actually influence it usually, not in, in that particular case, but you could. You could, uh, you could make a difference, make an impact. So that was kind of, that further increased my interest in moving towards the, the area of nephrology. And you also developed a, a particular interest in acute renal failure research right. during your time in Boston. Can you tell us yes, about that? indeed, Pat. Uh, really, uh, again, when I got to Boston City, I, despite my relative youth, etc., I uh, I was one of the few who knew anything about kidney machines again because of my experience in Dublin. So, myself teaching in Dublin. So, again, that fell to me then to sort of advise, if you will, on the deployment of this newfangled device, this kidney machine thing. And uh, so I, I, that, was, that was interesting. And furthermore, the chief of medicine was an inspirational man called Norman Levinsky, who really was a, a superb nephrologist uh, and was right in the thick of all the giants of nephrology in, in those days. And he inspired me too uh, to, you know, to, to embrace the specialty of nephrology. But it was then I moved to, after that, I moved to Tufts up the road from Boston City, Tufts New England Medical Center, as a research fellow. And I was doing bench research, that is micropuncture on the rat kidney. And at a, in its day, it was kind of state of the art. It's no longer done, of course, it's, it's been superseded. But it was uh, studying the effects of ischemia on, on renal uh, tubular function and morphology. And that turned out to be very, very interesting, challenging, uh, instructive. And uh, we, we managed to uh, uh, publish some very, I think, useful uh, data in uh, Kidney International uh, on the um, uh, effects of acute ischemic injury on the mammalian kidney. Uh, n analogous, if you will, to human acute renal failure, not quite, of course, very different in so many ways, but at least a semblance of, uh, uh, of it being similar to the human condition. So that to me was very instructive. And I remember one little message I took out of it was, I saw such destruction 
on electron microscopy of these renal tubules, I thought uh, it'd be very hard to cure that quickly. Our, our objective, of course, was to see could we um, ameliorate that injury or, or hasten its recovery. And because I think of, of, the, of the massive disruption that took place, it just had to take time to, to, to heal itself. And uh, I remember in more recent times, the trials of molecular agents and, and um, antibody agents in attempt and growth, anti-growth factor agents in attempting to accelerate the recovery, uh, shorten the recovery time, and, and they all failed, all of these trials failed. And I wasn't surprised simply because of the extent of the devastation that I saw down the electron microscope or on the electron microscope. I'm afraid we're still proving you right on that one. Thing. We're, we're doing <laughs> supportive I... care and we haven't a drug approved yet. This is it. We've got a few in phase two, so we're, we're, yes. we're, we're going to get there. Of course. But uh, let, let me just ask you, to, in summarizing your time in Boston, uh, obviously that you got a good welcome and uh, were successful there. Yes. Did, you, did you always intend over the eight years to return home or did you ever consider staying on there? No, that's a, that's a, that's a good question, Pat. I, I left, uh, and I may have touched on it earlier, I left with these warm feelings of my time in Dublin. I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I was a young doctor uh, with a wide group of friends, good friends. We'd soldier together, we were bonded together. We had little St. Vincent's, we had, um, you know, Stephen's Green, we had parties, we had, we had fun. And so I, in, I, I never really decided I would be going forever to the States. So I decided I was going to be coming back as soon as I could. And, uh, and that stayed with me. I never really changed. Now, I, I, I did well, I, I suppose. I, I, I went up the career ladder in Boston during that time. And, and, uh, but then the opportunity to come back did, did arise. And um, I remember Norman Levinsky and I having very long conversations and he finally said, well, look, uh, you know, if, you, if it was a question of competing for, for you to stay here, I, would, I could discuss salary, I could discuss promotion, I could discuss uh, more laboratory backup, etc. But if you're intent on going back, then I, it, 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 didn't, it wouldn't be appropriate for me. It wouldn't work. And I agreed with him. I had, I had some good offers, actually, just around the time I was leaving. I wanted to go to Columbus, Ohio, to head up the renal unit there. But I decided I would stick with what I'd planned to do and come home, Pat. That's what I did, yeah. And I wasn't, I'm not a bit sorry, looking back, that I did. So, so you came home in 1978 and you took up a, a post as consultant nephrologist in the National Renal Unit and the Transplant Unit at Jervis Street and then Beaumont, uh, and then at The Matter as well, uh, as part of your post, which is uh, where I got to spend some time with you as your intern. Can you tell us a bit about your t three decades in clinical medicine in Ireland? Yes, um, uh, Beaumont, of course, initially was Jervis Street, which again w had that uh, wonderful trait of being a comfortable place in which to work, full of very nice and, and agreeable people and uh, good work going on. and. Uh, but then that morphed into Beaumont eventually, and uh, and and all the time when I, you know, when I got back, it was um, it was quite a, a bustling development. By the time I did come back, but it really grew and grew and grew. Then once we got to Beaumont, uh, you know, the numbers on dialysis increased massively. The number of transplants increased hugely, and so the, the specialty was growing, growing, growing. And it was nice to be a part of that because. Uh, I, I hope I helped to, to uh, support that growth, uh, but you know it was happening anyway. And um, so, uh, yes, uh, really the, the, the whole thing then turned into a very different uh, job description than I had left behind. Although perhaps in my later years in Boston, I was preparing for this change because in Boston, then, I moved from being very heavily research orientated uh, at the bench to maybe 50% research, 50% clinical, and then less research as time went on, and then more teaching, more administration, more clinical uh, rounding, literally, hands-on patient care. So I was already, my, my, my career was changing. So when I came back then, it was just more of that. There was more, uh, very much more clinical involvement, lots more teaching, 
uh, some uh, and a growing amount of administration, and we tried to maintain some degree of clinical research with some success pat in that area. So that was that was good. So really, you were very much a generalist, actually, and uh, it was a little different from the structures that I'd left behind. But at the same time, there were lots of uh, different aspects to the job, interlocking, intertwining, some fun, some not so fun. Uh, and uh, I think in particular, the thing that impressed me most, Pat, was the quality of the uh, young people coming uh, through medical school. I mean, they were the best and the brightest and the smartest and the most enthusiastic. And they, they were a tremendous uh, source of, of uh, pleasure to me to see that degree of intelligence being channeled into our specialty. It was a delight. And uh, I look back and see how well they all have many, so many of them have done so well. I mean, including your good self. I mean, it's just remarkable. And, and uh, it, it's a great, um, what's the word, source of pride, perhaps, to people who, like me, were in a teaching role or, or a, a role model role, if you like. Uh, so that was great. And uh, also the specialty then, the uh, when I got back, transplantation was 50-50 success rate, perhaps, even less, maybe. Uh, and then over my time, that improved hugely. Now it's in excess of 95, 96, 97 percent success rates. So, you know, that was wonderful. And, and to see somebody, you know, tied to a machine for, for a long time, suddenly been uh, escaping into relative normality due to a successful transplant was uh, reinforcing uh, that you made the right decision, you got, you got into the right specialty, you know, at the time. That, that, that was my attitude, and um, it only continued over all those years. It really did. It kept, it kept getting better, you know. And I remember you, you maintained strong links with Boston. I remember John Harrington in particular, from your training, you, you kept uh, strong links with. Yes, uh, Pat, uh, John Harrington was a dear friend of mine, now, now the late John Harrington, unfortunately. But he was a remarkable person, uh, third generation Irish-American, perhaps. And through me, he, he said this, through me, uh, he sort of relearned his Irish background. And, uh, and he was very sad when, when we were leaving Boston, and I was too, but we did say, well, we'll keep in touch, etc. And lo and behold, we were hardly back in the country when he arrived in for a St. Patrick's Day weekend to Dublin. And our, we bought a house, but it was in bits. We were trying to put it right. He and his wife arrived. And uh, I was saying to myself, you know, he's going to hate this because the Americans do the St. Paddy's Day parade so well, he'd be bitterly disappointed. There won't be shamrock. There won't be leprechauns. There'll be nothing like that to, to see. But actually he came, I remember it was a freezing cold, uh, snowy St. Patrick's weekend. And, you know, he fell in love with the place. And he came back once or twice every year after that. You know, I couldn't keep him out of the place. And uh, if he was doing a nephrology forum, perhaps, for Kidney International in Moscow, which he, he did, he would route himself through Ireland every single time. If he was doing something in Edinburgh, he would route himself through Ireland. So he fell in love with the place. But he was a great uh, contact and friend of mine and was instrumental in helping me position uh, young Irish uh, trainees there in Boston. He was helpful uh, even to some of my own relatives and, and, and a niece of mine. He, he minded her and, and helped her train as a respiratory physician through his contacts in, in Boston. So. He was, he, he was a true friend, uh, John, his, 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 John was, and his, his wife is, is still alive, Trudy, and um, uh, he, he, I miss him really, you know, I miss his that contact to have. It was, it was just a very pleasant, uh, very enjoyable uh, friendship to have formed with him. And indeed, Pat, I meant to say at the outset that he was my first boss, if you like, in Boston City Hospital because the way the hospital was structured was the junior residents and the senior residents, but more so the junior residents, kind of ran the place. We made most of the clinical decisions, 
technically we were supervised by people like John Harrington, who were maybe a few years older than we were, uh, but not much. So, but he was my very first uh, boss in Boston City, and that's how we uh, got to know one another and how, how we developed this great friendship. And um, so I do, I do miss him. But it was extraordinary. His, his cap he was captivated by Ireland. I mean, you know, having been part, if you like, of perhaps the American melting pot uh, for, for some time when the, the goal was to try and blend in and be very American and, and so on, he just fell in love with this country and, and remained and maintained that love right up, right throughout his whole life, you know. So, uh, John, after three decades then as the, the a clinical leader in the Irish health system, you retired in 2007 and proceeded to move on to something equally challenging and as a president of the College of Physicians. Can you tell us about your time in that role? That was um, a marvellous development from my point of view. I'd been involved with the college as an officer for, for quite some time. Uh, and, you know, I think it's probably fair to say, Pat, that the college had lost its way a bit. Uh, it just was out of sync, really, with what was developing in mainstream medicine in Ireland, I think. Um, now, my predecessors set up a, a whole structure in terms of reforming the college and changing it. And uh, so uh, as I came into office, that was just kicking off. And it turned out to be a tremendous uh, boost, I think, for the college, where it became a professional body uh, with, with, with professional uh, officers, uh, paid uh, CEO, and uh, really quite quickly uh, became a, a, an important part of the life of physicians in this country, which it hadn't been, I think, for, for some time. It now became a, a, a hothouse, really, for postgraduate medical education, particularly, um, with online uh, uh, content long before COVID came along, uh, master classes. Uh, it also uh, uh, structured the entire specialist training program, uh, which has been a tremendous success. It also managed to get the ear of government and, and, and the health service executive, which it's never done previously. We were the last ones to hear about things. So in a lot of very important, pivotal ways, it. it uh, it, it was a slumbering giant really waking up and I happened to be on watch at the time and all I did really was to encourage these trends and to support them. And they paid off handsomely, I think, really. And the place is a, a vibrant force now, really, in Irish medicine, postgraduate, biggest postgraduate medical training body in Ireland. And uh, I think stands proud, Pat. And I'm, it was a wonderful time, but it wasn't all work. I. I traveled around the world. I went to uh, all kinds of, of uh, other colleges, made some friends from overseas, uh, president of London College, Ian Gilmore and I have remained fun, uh, fast friends for, 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 a lot, for since then. So it's, it's been great, Pat. That was a wonderful step down, if you like, from the, the hot world of, of acute nephrology and acute medicine and, and um, clinical consultancy. So it was great. And clearly the college has gone from strength to strength. Uh, and I, I have to ask you a couple of questions about current issues in relation to the college and postgraduate training. I wonder if any thoughts about, for example, the current controversy about the lack of availability of training posts for non-EU graduates in Ireland. I'm not sure what the resolution of that is. Uh, we did foster the concept of bringing um, postgraduate um, candidates from, say, the Middle East to, to Dublin and slotting them in as full, fully-fledged specialist registrars in, in, uh, in our training programs. And uh, that has proved to be very successful. Uh, I think the difficulty really is trying to uh, find the uh, capacity to, to take uh, more uh, than, than we do presently. Um, that may change as time goes on. But I do agree, Pat, it is a controversial area. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not privy now to the inner workings of the college anymore, because you do some time on the council afterwards and then you gradually fade away. 
but uh, I know I know it's receiving a lot of attention right now, actually, and I think hopefully there may be some breakthroughs in that area going forward. And I wonder, uh, John, do you have any thoughts about the the current difficulties we're having in persuading our excellent graduates to return to consultant posts in Ireland? Yes, uh, Pat, you know, um, that's a very pertinent thing to say. Um, I can tell you that back in my time, like, I couldn't wait to get back to Ireland. And it took me seven long years waiting for a vacancy to arise, a single vacancy to arise in, in seven years. And that was the nature of the, of the situation, supply and demand. Um, you know, the, the jobs weren't there. Even if you wanted to return to Ireland with your accumulated expertise, etc., that you would like to share, uh, the opportunities weren't there. So, as a result, you know, competition for jobs was of the highest uh, order. You know, you, you, people arose out of uh, <laughs> hiding places to appear uh, on the day of the interview for the job. And oftentimes, it was even hard to pick between the quality of the candidates that were so good. Now that continued for a very, very long period afterwards. So there was always several candidates for every job, more or less. Um, so they could pick and choose. Uh, now, it also applied, if you will, to non-consultant doctors, junior doctors. They were in huge supply. So I remember trying to pick uh, a registrar, say a renal registrar at the matter or uh, in Bowman, and you're faced with a stream of, of wonderful candidates, each one better than the other one, you know. So that uh, supply and demand thing was very much in favour of the person who was offering the, the position. And I remember sometimes feeling, you know, it w that I treated somebody unjustly because he or she was every bit as good as the person we appointed and may even have been slightly better. So, you know, there were these tremendous uh, d uh, uh, dilemmas due to the, the pure quality of what was coming through and the amount of talent coming through. But now, you see, I think things have changed and the, the overseas situation is better. I mean, my time at Boston City now was hideous, like I used to work all hours of the day and night. You know what I mean? It, it, great learning experience. I remember the surgical teams used to compete with one another to see who would make their rounds the earliest, like four in the morning, 4.30, before dawn, you know, this was the thing, the macho stuff. So a lot of that has changed now. So overseas practice can be much more attractive than it used to be. Places like Australia, very beguiling, you know, wonderful climate, life, life balance issues. So I think that it has, has lessened the attraction of coming back here. And, you know, it's almost an insoluble problem because we have this, uh, you know, we're producing such good young doctors and continue to do so. They're highly in demand everywhere they go. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful tribute to them and to our, our institutions, UCD and the other medical schools. Uh, so I'm not sure how best we can try and redress it. I mean, as you say, it's an old chestnut, a recurring chestnut, uh, which maybe it'll cure itself. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, th thanks for your, for your thoughts on the area. Uh, it's something, again, we're not going to solve here, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll compete better to, to lure people home in the future. And finally, John, uh, I wanted to ask you, in the course of a busy career, did you manage to maintain any hobbies? And can you tell us the kind of things you've done to relax over the years? I used to meet in, in uh, Fitzwilliam every Saturday morning for a tennis game. And then I would go off and finish up my rounds in Beaumont or, or the matter, as the case would be. I, I feel it did keep me sane. And uh, I then made the mistake of taking up this thing called golf, which uh, instead of sorting out my stresses, I think only added to the stresses, you know, the, the angst that's caused by playing mediocre or poor golf. And then the worst of all was uh, my wife dragged me into playing bridge uh, during, uh, shortly after I retired, and it seemed like a great idea. 
and I found that the most challenging of all and the most stressful of all. So I can't uh, really say, Pat, with any degree of, of, of truth that these have all worked out very well, but uh, to be truthful, uh, yes, I'm glad I did. I did these various things. They were useful, useful bridges to uh, keeping us grounded, I think, really, you know, if not, not happy all the time, but certainly uh, satisfied or grounded. Well, John, it's been a real pleasure to spend some time with you and, and talk about your career and your thoughts about uh, training and education in Ireland. It's uh, also been a real honour to work with you over the years. And uh, I want to join everyone in the school in congratulating you on the receiving the Medical Graduate Association Award, which is tremendously well deserved. And I want to thank you uh, on behalf of all the Medical Graduate Association members for spending this time with us and for your contributions to Irish medicine. Well done, John. Well, Pat, thank you so much. I appreciate this. I appreciate the trouble you've gone to to have make this happen. Uh, and I truly uh, am thrilled that I, I'm receiving this award from UCD uh, Medical Graduates Association. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted, Pat. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Donoghue. Um, my name is Jane Curtin. I work with the communications team at the UCD School of Medicine, and I've been monitoring questions during your interview, and thank you very much for, um, for that interview. So I'm just going to pose those questions to you now. Um, the first one is, um, we understand that you had regular contact with the Irish Kidney Association, and you witnessed the growth of that organisation during your time in Beaumont, and you became somewhat of an advocate for the Irish Kidney Association. So can you tell us a little bit about what that role involved? Yes, indeed, Jane, uh, thank you. Um, around the time I, I returned to Ireland, uh, late 70s, the uh, Kidney Association was just in formation, really. And uh, it became extremely uh, powerful advocate for, for patients with, with renal conditions. And it served a very useful role in uh, passing on uh, good information to, to victims of kidney diseases in general, and really played, I think, a huge role in that whole area of uh, uh, interface between physicians and, and patients, if you like. They were like gap in the middle, and they were very supportive of patients and did some great work. And what was really, I think, most enjoyable about the whole thing, Jane, was that sometimes advocacy groups, uh, you know, get it, we get into conflict with them unnecessarily very often, but never with the Kidney Association. They were always very sensible and, you know, they were well able to, um, uh, you know, inform people and advocate for people. And of course, they, their particular area of contribution was in the area of fostering the whole concept of kidney transplantation. And they introduced kidney donor cards for the first time and, and, and then supplied them to other specialties, heart, lung uh, groups uh, as, as well. So they really did serve and had, continue to serve, I think, a very useful role in that, in that whole area. Excellent. And that leads us nicely to our next question, which is how can we encourage more people to carry donor cards? It's an, another old chestnut. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> you know, uh, Jane, that, that was the stuff that we used to do and talk about very frequently. Uh, and uh, we uh, used to uh, come down on one or other side of the opt out scenario where you basically were considered to be a kidney transplant donor unless you specifically said you didn't wish to be or you had written it on your uh, your driving license uh, that you had opted out. So that uh, was a popular uh, concept for a very long time and adopted in some countries. We didn't really go down the road all the way. And I think we just, uh, through organizations like the Kidney Association, uh, promoted the whole concept of um, you know kidney donation uh, and uh, very very successfully I, I recall very high rates of uh, kidney donors um, compared to 
other nations. We were right up there, if you will, like we usually are when it comes to supporting famine areas and overseas charities, etc. We were very, very good at that in Ireland. So it it, it also played out in, in the Kidney Association and it, among kidney patients. So, you know, it was a, a wonderfully productive time in terms of trying to encourage people to, and they were, people were generous. And, and at times of, of great tragedy, say in families, they, through the work of our own uh, nurse coordinators, kidney transplant coordinators who did such good work, they would go in there at these very difficult times. And very often patients were so generous and courageous and uh, would consent to the use of their deceased beloveds um, um, remains uh, being used for, for to promote the life of others. Yes, it was a good time, Jane. <clears throat> Excuse me, on a different note, um, we'll be getting ready for the, the um, conferring ceremony for the 2021 graduates over the next couple of weeks. And one of the questions that has come in is, what are your top tip, top three tips for graduates? <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, if 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 I could say that um, med graduating into a, into medicine is is a, a fantastic uh, event. Uh, I've always felt that way. Um, it opens a world, a huge world of possibility. So, what the graduate needs to do is to try to have some idea as soon in their postgraduate career as to what they want to do and what they want to excel in. And that could be a, a whole variety of things. It, it can be a general practitioner, it can be a neurosurgeon, it can be any one of a multiplicity of opportunities. And also there are opportunities outside of medicine or allied to medicine like hospital management, leadership roles in, in managing hospital groups, uh, CEOs of, of teaching hospitals. There, there are lots and lots of uh, opportunities out there. So I think the, the important thing for, for graduates is to, to avail of these opportunities. Uh, they abound. Uh, you'll never be uh, uh, unwillingly uh, unemployed as a doctor. And so they, uh, the, the world is their oyster. They may end up going abroad and, and as many of them do. And that is a bit of a problem for us because we're trying to encourage them to stay here. Um, but I would have thought, Jane, that uh, the, the best thing for graduates is to be focused, to be uh, confident that what they've the, the fairly grueling time they've uh, they put in for the last six years or four years, the case may be, uh, w was really well worth it and has kitted them out for a, an international role if, if they want it or a highly productive role within Ireland uh, going forward. Excellent, thank you. Um, so not so much of a question, but a, a greeting in from Helena Daly. She'd like to send her congratulations on the receipt of your award this evening. Um, she said that you helped her with her first paper on MEA type 2 when she was in SHO with Professor Muldowney in 1976. That's nice. Um, That's nice. I'll send that, I'll send that along to you. Um, That's and nice then to just to, Good. Um, and then just um, to finish on a lovely high note, um, another question has come in. Um, do you have any memories that really stand out for you when parents donated kidneys to their children with very successful outcomes? Um, we saw you comment on a lovely article in the Irish Times in 2002, and I think you were looking after a gentleman called Tom Moore who donated his kidney to his six-year-old son, Josh. So maybe there are some family stories there that really stand out for you. Yes, yes. Uh, Jane, one... one quite extraordinary, not quite similar, but but analogous, if you like, was a situation where um, this lovely young woman, young lady, young girl rather, aged, we'll say 12, 13, came, was sent into clinic. And it was quite clear that she had big kidney problems. I mean, her, her kidney function was very poor and uh, quite soon she 
needed to, to go on dialysis for support. And this was sort of a tragedy at that age, if you like, uh, in German Street Hospital way back then. However, she then told me that she had a twin sister and uh, an identical twin sister. So we set in motion, uh, she was 13, maybe going on 14. We set in motion a huge effort to see if it would be possible for us to help to uh, the, the, the healthy sister to donate to her, to her uh, sister who was suffering kidney disease. And we ran it through uh, religious groups. We ran it through ethical committees. We we engaged with lawyers. We did our very best to to make sure we weren't infringing any civil rights or or human rights issues. And in the end, I recall one very uh, eloquent and sensible social worker saying, "It it it's not that it isn't right to do it. It's wrong not to do it." And that that was the sort of turning point. So, to, long story short. This took place. The donor twin had never looked back, and I, I know that uh, as of today, or as of recently. And the other uh, young lady is doing uh, fantastically well. Has had a family, and um, you know the whole thing was a marvelous uh, success, really. So that was my one and only experience of being involved with. Uh, Tra transplantation in identical twins and of course the beauty of it all is they, the the recipient of the kidney doesn't need to take any drugs because the tissue is identical we're just moving tissue from one twin to the other so uh, if that was a huge success and a heartwarming experience for me certainly and uh, what i often think about it from time mm -hmm. to time that's a superb story. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And again, congratulations on your award. Um, so we'll hand, a, uh, hand back now to Professor Keane, who's going to conclude the proceedings for this evening. Thank you very much, Jane, for all of your hard work. Thank you, Professor Murray and Dr. Dunhu for such a fascinating and engaging interview. I would now like to present Dr. Dunhu with his Distinguished Graduate Award and sincere congratulations from all of us at the MGA and from all UCD Medicine alumni to him. Thank you again to all of you for joining us and for all the questions you submitted. As alumni of our school, you are our ambassadors around the world and no doubt incredibly proud of UCD's heritage in providing medical education since 1855, the school's strong presence and bright future. Today, the association works in close partnership with the UCD Alumni Development Office offer a platform so that we can all honour that tradition and keep in touch with each other across the world, have a lifelong link with UCD and an opportunity to influence the school's future. So please consider that the MGA is your association. Finally, we hope you all enjoy this important occasion and we look forward to inviting you to our 2022 Distinguished Graduate Awards Series when we hope to be back in the O'Reilly Hall on the UCD campus to host this event in person.